So thank you, Ilka, very much for this nice introduction and for the credits. I hope I can show you very exciting things as you expect. And of course, I want to, to thank you both for inviting me for the seminar. Of course, to Nick to organize all this very marvelous and exciting seminar series. So this is a seminar series of cyanobacterial biology. And it's amazing that you really find speakers which cover all different aspects of cyanobacterial life. And today I want to tell you what we found out about cell cell communication systems of filamentous cyanobacteria. And first of all, I want to acknowledge the people who were involved deeply in this project I want to show you today. And first of all, we had Anne Katrin Kieninger, who was a PhD student in my lab, and she is now replaced by Anna Janovic. And we are all closely related to Karl Forchermos group and work together in the same place. And this whole program wouldn't have been possible with the contribution of Martin Pilhofer's people. First of all, Gregor Weiss, who was his PhD and is now a postdoc there, and was followed by Piotr Tokarz, who is now the PhD and working with us in this topic. So, of course, in this audience, I don't have to tell you about cyanobacteria. So here you can see a picture of a filament of Anabena, which is also known as Nostoc, PCC 7120, is a model organism and the pet in our lab. And you can see that several cells differentiate to heterocysts when these filaments are grown on medium without nitrate or ammonia or any nitrogen source. So we can imagine that the heterocysts, which are the sites of nitrogen fixation, have to be supported by the photosynthetic active vegetative cells, which then deliver the photosynthates like sugars to the heterocysts. And on the other hand, the heterocyst then delivers fixed nitrogen compounds like amino acids to the vegetative cells in the filament. All these molecules, some metabolites, but also some signaling molecules, which take care of the semi-regular organization or the pattern of this heterocyst, have to be transported from cell to cell along the filaments. And by doing this, they have to cross the septal wall. And in very previous studies, we have elucidated a special structure in the peptidoglycan of the septum. You can see here a top view of this peptidoglycan. And we could show that it contains holes, which we called nanopores. So this structure we called nanopore array. And we were speculating that these holes are the channels where metabolites can pass through. And to have a closer look and to find out whether the holes are filled by protein structures, which we called septal junctions, also other labs call them septal junctions and are working on this, I have to say. You're not the only lab who's working in this field. So we check a mutant in a cell wall amidase. This is an enzyme that can cleave the peptidoglycan. And we found that mutant in this amidase MEC in Ostok punctiforme, but also later on we found the same thing in other Anabena and Ostok species, that this mutant is not able to make this pores. But what is now important for this talk is that this mutant is also not able in cell-cell communication, that means to transfer any molecules along the filament. So this was the first proof that these nanopores are the transit routes for the molecules. And then we teamed up with the Pilofer group and asked them to make their very sophisticated and state-of-the-art cryo-electron tomography. So Gregor Dutch froze the filaments and then made very thin slices of the filaments and looked at the septum and gave us this little movie. So you can see two cells here. And here you see the septum with the peptidoglycan. And you see here always popping up some of these cell-cell connections. They go through the nanopores and they have some structures on each side. And now let's have a closer look on these structures. So here you can see one of these slices of, of such an vitrified filament in the tomogram. And here's a magnification of it. So we could recognize that there are several They always go through the nanopores and they can adjust the size according to the distance of the two neighboring cell membranes. And when we have a closer look to it, so Gregor could average hundreds of these pictures and got this average picture. And so we could identify some structural modules which build up these structures. So on the cytoplasmic side of each cell, like on this side and also on that side, we have this structure we call a cap. You can look on top of it and you can see the structure here. 
And when you continue down to make a cross section in this plane, you can see that there's a five fold rotational symmetric dome. And when you continue and you make a section through the membrane, you can see that there is a plug sitting in the membrane. And when you continue down, you can see that here is something that we called finally a tube component, which has an average inner diameter of approximately seven nanometers. And the whole thing goes through nanopores, and you can make such a model of it, how it may look like. So the cap here is shown in green and then continues down with a plug and then the tube, which continues to go down to reach to the other side of the septum and ends up with the same structure in the neighboring cell. We don't know how it works, this is a symmetric building up. Of course, we don't know many things yet and we're still working on it. We speculated that a structure could change and make a conformational change to regulate the cell-cell communication and the molecule transfer. Maybe it can close or it can reduce the transfer. And therefore, we thought which conditions could lead to such a change in the structure and in the communication of the cells. And so we suggested to our PhD student to perform FRAP experiments using some inhibitors. And what is a FRAP experiment? A FRAP experiment, most of you may know, it is fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. So we stain the filament with a dye which gets fluorescent inside the cell, cannot escape the cell anymore. Then we bleach one single cell with a laser beam, and then we can observe how the dye comes back because it now enters from the neighboring cells into that bleached cell because there is a cell-cell communication. When we add the ionophore like CCCP as an inhibitor of the proton gradient, it destroys the proton gradient, you could observe that the up, this recovery of dyes never occurs. So it looks like that indeed this scepter here completely shut down or close their junctions. And they don't allow any entrance of the dye from the neighboring cells anymore when we use this stress compound, the so CCCP. And you can see it here, when we increased the concentration of CCCP, we could see an increase of no communication cells, which are shown here in dark orange, and the green bar shows the full recovery after the bleaching. So Gregor decided to perform now his cryo-electron tomography after he had incubated the filaments the same way with CCCP. And indeed, you could actually recognize that they really make a structural change. And I will show you in a minute how it looks in more detail. Another experiment was done by Anne Katrin. She washed now the filaments after CCCP treatment, and now she could see that they could open again. They reopened again, and this reopening was independent from protein biosynthesis, as shown here by using the chloramphenicol. So you could see that septic junctions close upon disruption of the proton multiforce, and that in this case, a major structural rearrangement occurs in the septic junctions. And that the ionophore treatment, it was not the only stress. We also could see that other stress conditions like oxidative stress, darkness, and so on, also lead to closing of the septal junctions. But they could open again after the stress was gone. And this showed us that it's a reversible process. And therefore, we could say that septal junctions are gated cell-cell connections Good. Here is some pictures showing you the structures of this closed state compared to the open state here on the right side. And you could see a major difference here in this cap structure. So the five, I always say they are fingers, they rotate somehow and go together to this circular structure and made this little movie to show how it could look like. It occurs very quickly, of course. And there were no changes visible in the plug structure or in the tube structure. Now we wanted to know which proteins are making the septal junctions or part of the septal junctions build up the septal junctions. So we went to the literature and we went to our older results and projects because we had observed several proteins already and also other groups had observed several proteins already, like the group von Enrique Flores, with whom we collaborated pretty much on analysis of these mutants, were known, which are involved in cell-cell communication. And these mutants had severe phenotypes concerning the nanopore array formation. So they could not make the pores or less pores. They could not really make functional heterocysts. The proteins were localized in the septum and so on and so on. These were all indications that they could be involved in the septal junctions formation or be part of the septal junctions. 
So when we looked at the so-called MBC1 mutant, which has very low amount of nanopores in the septum, and in the sept mutant, which also has a very low amount of nanopores, we could see that in the tomogram, there was not really a difference to the wild type. Everything was present, the tube, the plug, and the cap. This was a little bit surprising, but when we then measured our gating experiment with the CCCP in the FRAP experiment, we could see that even though in these mutants, they really have a problem with communication, a very low rate of communication, this low rate of communication is still inhibited by CCCP, so the gating is still possible. So from these two experiments, we could say that MEC and ZJ are not components of septal junctions, but somehow they are necessary for cell cell communication, and we don't know the real function of ZJ yet, but you can say MEC is involved in drilling the nanopores into the septal peptidoglycan. Then we continued the study with other proteins which has been investigated before, and these are the FRA protein, uh, other FRA proteins, so FRA C, FRA D, and the J I showed you already, and we had some triple mutants and so on. And all these mutants are affected somehow in the nanopore formation, so they had a highly reduced number of nanopores, and the nanopores were slightly bigger than the wild-type nanopores. And as shown by previous studies, also from other groups, the FRA mutants showed very low FRAP activity. So we sent the mutants to Gregor and he now performed the electron tomograms. And as you can see here in this picture, especially in this picture, the FRA D mutant is absolutely void of a plug and a cap. This looks like just an open tube or open channel. Everything can go through. There is nothing present on top of it in the membrane or on the cytoplasmic side. But the cap and plug module are missing. The Frasi mutant is not so clear. It has a heterogeneous phenotype. There is something, but it looked different. And the double mutant, of course, looked like the Frasi mutant. So when we performed then our FRAP studies, also in presence of our inhibitor, we could see that a mutant which does not have the plug and the cap, a D mutant or the double mutant, was not able to close. So gating was now not possible anymore, was not able to close even when we added high amounts of CCCP. So from this study, we could say that the Ramudans lost the gating and that probably there are components, at least RD is a component, maybe the plug or the cap or something in between of the septal junctions because mutant does not have plug and cap. Then we tried to see FRAD in the septal junctions, and therefore we fused GFP to FRAD. FRAD is a predicted membrane bound protein with an N terminus facing to the cytoplasmic site, as addiction says. And here we fused the GFP. And when we gave this mutant to Gregor and he analyzed it in the tomography, he could clearly see a difference here in this area coming from the plug. And here you have the difference map wild type minus mutant, and you could see clearly that there was an extra protein, and this is the GFP tag. And this tag was also somehow influencing the gating ability of the septal junction. So when FRAD was fused to GFP, the gating was possible, but the reopening was not possible anymore. And the overall performance in cell communication was a little bit inhibited by this fusion. So it has an influence on the cell cell communication, which was another indication that it is a part of the septal junction. And from this picture, we concluded that FRAD must sit somewhere at the plug or maybe in between. And of course, you could conclude that the plug and the cap are necessary for closing and gating. We continued and wanted to isolate or identify more proteins which are involved in the septal junctions. And therefore, Ankatrin performed co-immunoprecipitation using the membrane protein FRAD as a bait. So cultures were grown either the wild type or the gfp 4 d mutant strain, and the cells were broken and the membrane solubilized, and then precipitation occurred with the antibody against the GFP or the FRAD, depending on which culture we were using. And then we could precipitate many, many proteins and performed LCMS analysis in the proteome center in Tübingen and got a list of proteins. And the best hit we got was this protein ALL4109, which we then called sep -N. You will see in a minute why. The prediction of this protein showed that it is also membrane bound with one helis. In the cytoplasmic side, it's the N-terminus. And in the periplasmic side, there is a huge part of the protein localized with the C-terminus. 
But when Ankatrin performed the opposite experiment using this now sep n antibody, he could fish by cold moon precipitation again the 4D protein. This was a clear indication that sep n and 4D really interact. So when we fused that into the superfolded GFP, we could nicely see it that it localizes to the scepter of the filament, as you can see here, the red odd fluorescence and the green GFP fluorescence. And this localization of that N was a little bit independent from RD, because when we introduced the whole construct into 4D, now expressing a sub n with the superfolded GFP, the localization was not so clear and so nice like here in the wild type background. Then we looked for the formation of the nanopores because we thought maybe ZN phenotype should be similar to FRAD, but it was not. Here again, the FRAD, septal peptidoglycan, only very few nanopores. And here you can see the peptidoglycan in the septum of a sub n mutant. And it looked very similar to the wild type with several aspects. So the number of the pores was very similar and also the size of the pores. And then, of course, the complemented mutant was the same, and the GFP mutant was also very similar. So the septal nanopore array in the sub n mutant is similar to the wild type, and the 4D mutant forms less nanopores. But then, of course, you are now very interested, I know, and we are very interested to see how cell cell communication works in the sub n mutant. And the cell, cell communication rate was highly reduced compared to the wild type. It was similar to the FRAD mutant, even though the nanopores were there. And so we expected that each nanopore should have a separate junction, but still the, the communication rate was highly diminished. This could be complemented by introducing a ZN and wild type version into the mutant. The GFP mutant had also some problems with communication, but I will go to this detail in a second. Okay, so the wild type, as we know already, it shows very nice gating. So after CCCP treatment, the cells close. After washing, they open again. The FRAD mutant, we know they cannot gate. And the ZN mutant, as you see here, also is not able to perform gating. So the cells still communicate even if the stress in form of CCCP is present. So ZN is required for gating, similar to FRAD. And now we really wanted to see how the septal junctions look of a ZN mutant. And therefore, we gave the mutants now to the PhD student from Gregor Piotr, and he performed now the cryo-electron tomography, and he could clearly see that the plug is missing. The cap is still here, but there is an interesting aspect of the cap. Here you can see the wild type in an open conformation. That means no stress of the filaments. And here you can see the closed state of the wild type, because this wild type has been incubated with CCCP before performing the experiment. So then they're close. This was clear here. And when we looked at the closed state, that means non-treated filaments of the sub n mutant, the septal junctions looked like the closed septal junctions of the wild type. So the plug is absent and the cap is in a closed state. And there was also a difference because the number of septal junctions per septum was reduced. So Piotr told us that he really found nanopores which were empty. So the block module is crucial for functional gated septal junctions. Then we wanted to perform a similar experiment as we did before with FRAD, and we fused a tag to sub n to identify it in the electron tomograms. Because the GFP tag was not big enough to see anything, maybe it was flexible, we don't know exactly, we decided to make a much bigger tag, so we also fused maltose binding protein to the gene. It localizes nicely to the scepter, so it works obviously. And then Piotr performed the cryo-electron tomography, as you can see here. And what you see immediately is the cap is gone. So obviously this large tag avoids the correct assembly of a cap. However, we could see extra densities here in the blood region coming out facing to the cytoplasmic side. We are pretty sure that this is the sub n protein with the large tags of maltose binding protein and GFP. And this large tag is somehow avoiding the cap assembly. And we don't know whether sub n alone in the plug is it sufficient to form the plug structure or if there are even more proteins present. So we performed also the FRAP experiments again, and we could see that the large tag really is inhibiting the whole cell cell communication system because it was just too big. And then we wanted to prove that cell cell communication and the regulation of cell communication, the gating, is really important for the anabena or for other filamentous cyanobacteria. It means it's essential for survival of the stress, or involved at least in the survival of the stress. 
And now we didn't use CCCP, but Gregor used five minute UV treatment. This experiment has been done in Anabena previously in another study from Gregor, and he decided now to check our mutants, which are not able to get or to stop cell cell communication upon stress, to analyze whether they still can survive after five minutes UV treatment. And so you can here see now here in the wild type that after UV treatment, single cells of the filaments bleach out. So they are ghost cells now and they are dying. And when you look at the FRAD mutant or the sep n mutant, also after a while, contiguous cells, adjacent cells start to bleach out quickly. And then finally, after a few hours, the whole, more or less the whole filament died. And you can see this also in this graph, which shows survival after UV treatment of the wild type in green and the two mutants, which are not able to close their septal junctions because they are missing lock and cap. So, and then Anna also performed a FRAP study after UV treatment. So similar as before with the CCCP treatment. So she performed the same experiment like Gregor for the survival study. And you could see now that wild type indeed closes quickly almost all of the cells in the filament. But the FRAD and the N mutant cannot do so. They have some problems, but they cannot really do the gating. So this showed us that the control cell, cell communication is crucial for filament survival after stress. I want to summarize now what I told you today. So the cell, cell communication occurs through septal junctions, which consist of three modules, the cap, the plug, and the tube. The septal junctions are gated, cell cell connections which close upon stress, and they can reopen when the stress is gone. The septal junction cap and plug modules are crucial for the gating, as you could show with mutants which are lacking these modules. So FRAD and sep n are most likely structural components of septal junctions. FRAD could be a linker between tube, plug, and cap. We don't know exactly where it sits, but the GFP tag sits very close to the plug, and sep n localizes to the plug modules for sure. So gating is required for survival by isolating injured cells from sister cells. This was clear from this study, I think. I hope you agree. So finally, in addition to the people I acknowledged already in the beginning who were really hard working on this project, is Jan Bonnikol, who was also involved in the project in initially and was helping a lot with the SWAP experiments, Claudia Menzel, our technician, and Merita Franz Wachtel from Proteon Center, who performed the MS study after the immune precipitation. And Enrico Flores for providing us with the mutants and ZepJ and the FRA mutants. Konrad Molino for his initial help in the FRAP technique when he teached Jan for in a short visit in London. And Peter Walk, as always, for providing us with his very nice tools, the vectors to perform all of these studies with GFP localization and make movements and so on. And of course, I thank you for your attention.